I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running I always take what I want and I always give it 100 Don't need a bank, no I'm funded Play the game like it's nothing I'm always thankful for something Don't take for granted, stay humble Now waiting, better believe in your mind Cause it's everything You can mold, shape, find almost anything Hey everybody, this is Praxis. One thing that people don't get a lot of here on my channel is the doom and gloom treadmill where every single day or every couple days I'm saying this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, get ready, get ready, get ready. Uh, there are a lot of channels out there that do that and that's not a bad thing at all. In fact, there's a lot of channels uh, that are very reliable that have a uh, good track record for sharing uh, accurate information and making pretty solid predictions on things that I like to uh, tune into now and then and I think that's a, a nice service that uh, they offer here to the community but I don't tend to do it here on my channel uh, for one reason, uh, I feel like a lot of other people are doing that and there's not a real need for that and what I like to do is generally kind of share what I'm working on uh, with you guys you know I'm doing this project and doing this project you know things that I'm doing to try to improve my life and improve my preparedness uh, but one downside of my not doing that here on my channel is I feel like it might give the impression that those uh, those sorts of scenarios are things that aren't actively on my mind aren't things that I'm necessarily thinking about very much and nothing could be further from the truth at the time of this recording we are looking at a uh, escalation in te uh, tensions between the United States and China. Uh, we've uh, been experiencing an escalation in tensions between the United States and Russia for some time. Uh, and these are things that, uh, you know, they're not really surprising. I remember as early uh, as, uh, I guess, you know, December of last year, I kind of made predictions about what I saw uh, coming this year in 2022 as challenges. And I, I remember one of the big ones I talked about was geopolitical risks, that there's a lot of uh, competing interests and it looks like they're probably going to start coming to a head this year. And and well, it looked like that prediction is really starting to bear, uh, bear horrifying apocalyptic fruit. So in this video, what I want to talk about is some of the things that I have been doing, have been working on, uh, to, to try to get ready for the potential of there being, uh, you know, a kinetic war between the United States and Russia, kinetic, uh, kinetic war between the United States and China potentially, you know, these are things that, you know, certainly here in the prepping community, the, the you know, all the same preppers, it's nothing that we're hoping for, certainly, but it, it is something that a lot of us are, you know, potentially planning for because, uh, you know, even if you don't want something to happen, if it does happen, you're better off if you've prepared for it. So in this video, I want to talk about what I've been doing to get ready for the horrifying potential that there could be nuclear exchanges between the United States and Russia, the United States and China, because I still believe as much as I did at the end of last year, back when I was making predictions about this year, that there are real world actual tactile things that are going on in the world in terms of resource scarcity, uh, you know, environmental changes that are really driving people to be competing for things that they didn't really need to compete for uh, quite as much in the past. And these competitions, you know, all throughout history, at least, uh, always tend to go towards war, unfortunately. That's how humans tend to solve our problems. Uh, the peace times, you know, for example, the peace time that we've been experiencing since, uh, you know, you know, the, the, the past several decades or so, I know it doesn't really seem like peace. You know, it's been a nonstop treadmill of war here in the United States, you know, starting war in Afghanistan or here or there, or, you know, Iraq and everywhere. Uh, but in terms of, you know, real world war with major powers fighting each other, there's been a real lull. And I think that uh, that's gotten a lot of people into the, the sense that th this is the norm. This is what's normal. But if you look back historically, war is really what's normal, unfortunately. And that's just, you know... Thank Homo sapiens, that's how we solve our problems. So I'm planning for the future being just as normal as the past has been. We've had a little bit of atypical peace uh, recently, but you know, normal for humans is fighting and war and conflict and pain and suffering. And you know, if you can get ready for that, you're gonna have a little bit less suffering in your life and hopefully in the life of your family. So what I wanna talk about in this video is what we've been doing. Right behind me is our fallout shelter. This has been a root cellar for quite a while, uh, but I built it so that it could be turned into a fallout shelter if we needed to use it as a fallout shelter. I wasn't really necessarily anticipating that we'd have to do it so soon, uh, but within a couple of years of finishing the root cellar, it became pretty obvious that the fallout shelter's second use was probably gonna be something that would be wise to invest in. So that's what you, you see here behind me. Uh, we've got this elevated, uh, I'm, I'm actually just gonna, for this video, I'm gonna snap the camera off of, uh, the tripod 
and give you a little tour of what we got here. This is an elevated uh, lump on the ground. Uh, this thing right here, this is a vent. I'm working on fit, completing this vent. This vent actually sends air down into the root cellar and it's going to be, hopefully soon, sending air into the house as well. Uh, that's a topic for a whole other video. But what we got here is this big lump of earth on the ground. You can see the rocks all around the, the periphery here. There's a big mound here and this is up on top of the root cellar. Now, uh, adding the extra dirt on top helps to keep the root cellar cooler uh, because root cellars are, you know, what you use for storing, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables and things like that. Uh, it, it's not super functional in the summertime because it's not really deep enough. Our, our particular root cellar isn't deep enough in order to give us uh, really cool temperatures all through the summer. Uh, but certainly through the majority of the year, you know, from the harvest time until the, the following spring, it wor it's working really, really well. And we added an extra foot, foot and a half or so of dirt on top to make it a better fallout shelter. Now let's let's pop inside here and we're gonna see what's going on inside. But you know, before we do, I probably shouldn't grab the tripod because we may need that. So here we are down at the entrance of the root cellar or fallout shelter. And one thing I think that uh, jumps out at me initially is it's kind of nice looking. Um, I think that's one thing that is really important when it comes to preparing things early. You know, if you wait to the last minute, uh, things can be really ramshackle and, you know, not, not really look all that nice. But one of the things that I made sure when I was doing this is that I, you know, I did the best that I could to try to make it so that, you know, it's kind of attractive. Uh, so that, uh, you know, even if you never need to use it as a fallout shelter, it's still kind of an attractive piece of uh, the landscaping around here. I think it feels a little bit like, kind of like a hobbit hole right over there. It's like, this is a bag end. And, uh, Let's go in through the door and we'll see what's inside. We've got a, uh, a hasp on here. Uh, that obviously could be used to lock us in. We do have a, uh, a hatchet. If you ever get locked in here, you could hatch it your way out. Now, as we come in here, I think you'll notice that uh, it's pretty dark. And those little lights you see on the walls, the, the camera's uh, slowing down to try to see as much as it possibly can. Those little lights that you do see on the walls, though, those are light tubes. And the reason I installed light tubes is, you know, push comes to shove. Even if you lose all the power in here, the light coming in from those light tubes will give you at least some ability to see in here so you're not plunged pitch black into a tomb. But because it's still pretty dark, even with the light tubes in, I'm going to turn on the lights in here and the camera's going to adjust. And here we are inside of the fallout shelter. Now we're going to run through uh, just the, some of the different things that are in here. Why don't we start kind of from this end. We got here is the bathroom area. There's a sink and that has uh, cold and cold running water in. We have one water line that comes in and then gets split uh, up to both of the faucets. Uh, would it have been nice if I had warm running water in? Yeah, that would, but uh, this, this is a heck of a lot easier. We just ran one water line in you can see it runs up here, and I'll show you where that enters into the structure in a little bit. But there's the, uh, the sink, and we've got a toilet here, which is just a bucket. It's just a bucket with a lid. These are the kind of lids you can get for a five-gallon pail. And uh, those are sold for, like, camping or fishing or whatnot. This right here is some extra wires. As I do the last bit of finishing up on our solar electric system, and this is a, a backup solar electric system. We have a solar electric system on the house. The house is off grid. So if there was a, a massive grid down event, the house still gets electricity and the house sends power into this structure right uh, here. In fact, the light that's coming in here right now is being sent here from the house. But if the house went down for whatever reason and we needed to have uh, electricity in, in here, and I guess the word need is in quotes, you know, it's more of a want than a need, but if we wanted to have electricity in here, this is a backup system so we could have at least some amount of electricity. Now, you might notice that when I'm standing in this area here, my voice is very echoey. And as I step over into to this area over here, it's not nearly so echoey. A lot of that is due to this, uh, this flooring material. This is a three quarter inch foam floor and it absorbs a lot of that stray sound so it makes it 
not quite so maddening to be in here because being in a, in a space with all that kind of echo, it, it is kind of crazy if you need to use this as a fallout uh, space and you're in here for two weeks, I think you could drive yourself crazy with all that echo. Uh, so the floor helps with that and the floor also just makes it a lot more comfortable to walk around on. It's a, a really nice material to, to walk on and it, it took what was really kind of a tomb-like feel and made it uh, a lot more comfortable to be in here. Just walking around, it's kind of like you're on uh, sort of carpeting. And also the color, I think, adds to it. And the color was discretionary. I could have black, white, or gray, or blue. When I chose blue, if you're going to be stuck in, in a tomb for two weeks, if you're using it as a fallout shelter, then uh, I thought it would be nice to have some color in here outside of just uh, all the, the white and silver that we have uh, rocking as it is. Now, we've got a couple of shelves in here. I'm going to go through what we have on the shelves. Most of it is food and tools, and we're not completely stocked for food yet. Uh, that's something that we're kind of working on, uh, but uh, you know, we've got quite a bit of food on here. We'll kind of go through what we got. First, let's go through this shelf here, which has a lot of tools and, uh, and has some food on it. Up here, we've got uh, some cheese macaroni for my boy, and we do have the ability to, uh, to cook in here. Here's a cooking pot right next to it. Uh, we are able to cook using electricity that comes in here from the house or the solar backup system could also supply that, uh, that electricity. And right here, you can probably make this out. This is uh, it's a fire extinguisher. I was kind of uh, curious when I saw this. I've never seen a fire extinguisher in kind of like a spray bottle before, but if we had a fire in here, that would be a way of uh, uh, putting it up, uh, putting it out. Now, obviously using this in a, a small enclosed space, there would be issues related to that, uh, you know, like all the gases that come out of this, and that's certainly a consideration, but if you got an active fire, you, you got to get that fire put out first. Uh, coming around to the other side, over here, got some other things. We've got some, uh, some seltzer that's just, you know, water in there, and we got some vitamins in these boxes here, and here is some sprouting seeds, and you can do sprouting seeds without sunlight, so that would be a way of getting some, uh, some fresh greens while we were, uh, you know, kind of cooped up in here. Coming around to the other side over here. One thing that's pretty important up here is this box labeled lead clothing. And what's next to it is an unlabeled box that has disposable uh, kind of jumpsuits in it. Well, the reason we have this isn't so that we would wear lead clothing the entire time that we're in here, although I suppose it would add an extra uh, degree of uh, safety while we're in here. The reason I really put this uh, lead clothing uh, box in here in these jumpsuits is if, God forbid, we had to leave for some reason. If there's something that we forgot, uh, you know, some critical thing that I can't foresee at the moment. Uh, if there's some situation where I had to leave here to get something that was important for the survival of my family, I would want to have, you know, the most protection that I possibly can. And that would involve uh, shielding my body with uh, this, uh, this clothing. And I'll explain what's in here in just a moment. And then covering everything up with these disposable uh, jumpsuits uh, that I bought. I think I have like 10 or 20 in that box. And, uh, you know, it's I don't know why I would use these things, but this is the kind of thing where if I needed to leave, I would absolutely want to have these materials. Now, what's in here uh, are the types of um, uh, things that you might wear if you go to the dentist and they are uh, doing x-rays on you, uh, like those lead aprons that they might put on you or the, uh, the smock that the operator is using while they are running the x-ray machine. That's what I purchased, that's what's in there. Uh, so it's not, it's not uh, incredibly thick uh, lead lining, but it's something, it's something additional. If you needed to go out, the way to protect yourself is to put as much between you and the radiation as possible. That's where we get the lead. And I, I do have some just sheets of rolled lead that you could use to kind of wrap around your head or <laughs> your crotch or whatever, you know, to, to, to give you some additional options. But the other thing that you can do is if you're gonna be exposed to radiation is limit the time. Uh, so know exactly what you're gonna do in, out, and then get yourself back out and clean. And these disposable jumpsuits are so that you could just rip them off, leave them outside and, um, uh, you know, worry about that in two weeks when you leave. And we do have respirators in here as well if you are going to need to, uh, uh, to do that because you wouldn't want to be breathing stuff and have it uh, inside of your lungs. Again, you can see some of these things in here. We've got apples and onions and there are some potatoes. These are things that are in here just from its use as a, uh, 
a root cellar. Uh, the proximity of the onions to the potatoes, by the way, is not ideal. Uh, those are two things you want to have kind of kind of far apart from each other, but we're still kind of rearranging things in here and uh, you know getting things together as we go. Over here, we've got a bin, and this is all medical stuff. We've got uh, more vitamins in here, bandages, respirator masks. Uh, we've got Q-tips, all that, that that sort of thing. We've got some protein powder here. This guy obviously falls into the food category. And behind the protein powder, toilet paper for use with that, uh, that toilet that we mentioned earlier. Uh, here's some more sanitary products. Uh, in addition to the toilet paper, the tampons, pads, etc. Dental stuff, toothpaste, toothbrushes, all that kind of thing. Coming down over here, we've got uh, a bin that has uh, things related to the toilet. We've got, these are some toilet bags that are made specifically for uh, these kind of toilets in a five gallon pail. We've got some heaters in here. There's some heating pads underneath. These are electric kind of foot heating pads. Up top here, this is a little space heater. Now with people occupying this space uh, for any kind of extended period of time, I think the temperature in here, you're not gonna be risking it getting too cold in here. I think if anything, you're going to risk it maybe getting a little too warm in here with people in here. But, you know, it's nice to have the option and it's better to have it and not need it than need to not have it. So we got some heaters in here. I also got a, a spoon for working with uh, the pot if we're cooking. Uh, we have our uh, uh, little cooking uh, stove uh, units in there. It's just a little hot pad. We got two of them. Uh, we'd only be using one, but we have one plus a backup. It's a little shower curtain we're going to be installing on the other side over here uh, is a privacy curtain because uh, that's going to be the bathroom and you know with people in clo close quarters it seemed like it would make sense to uh, you know give people a little bit of privacy. Uh, in this box right here we've got kind of like arts and crafts supplies, uh, notepads, drawing pads, uh, crayons, colored pencils, pens, things like that. You know things that can occupy your time and help you so that you know you and your family aren't going nuts if you're stuck in some place for, for two weeks straight. Down in this bin, we've got some uh, uh, gear and tools. There's a radio that gets both FM and shortwave. We've got this box here, which contains uh, a couple of Geiger counters. This is uh, sealed up as an EMP-proof Faraday box. Uh, it's a metal lunch box with aluminum tape all over it. Uh, again, two Geiger counters because it's really important that you are able to know what the radiation threat is because it's uh, it's invisible. You can't see it, taste it, smell it, touch it, or anything like that, but it'll still touch you. So we want to make sure we have a definite ability to know whether it's safe to go back outside. Got power strips and also an internet router in there. We ran... Um, a lot of information lines in here, I mentioned uh, both FM and stereo, uh, I'm sorry, FM and shortwave radio can be picked up by this, this radio unit in here. We're running uh, FM and a shortwave radio line in here. We also have a uh, coaxial cable running in internet, and th this router would allow us to uh, get internet in here. Now, th the first thing I know that you know, trolls here on YouTube are always going to say is, well, you know, the internet is going to be the first thing that goes down, so why do you even have that? Yeah, sure, it might, but if it doesn't, or it doesn't go down right away, this will give us the uh, the ability to get some information from it, and if it uh, you know is not available, and we just have a router in here for no reason, you know, boohoo, who cares? You know, it was uh, something that we have access to if we can use it. No guarantee we can use it, but if we can, it'd be nice to have it, and and that's why we do. Down here, we've got a bin full of this is kind of medical stuff, but it's medical stuff specific to radiation exposure. Uh, there's uh, uh, pectin pills in here, uh, potassium iodine in here, uh, you know, calcium supplements, uh, different types of uh, uh, clay and things. And you know what, I, instead of myself going through that, what I would suggest is uh, Hoople's Cat has a wonderful YouTube channel with lots of preparedness information, and he put together a really wonderful video that I found super informative. It informed pretty much everything uh, that is in this bin for me. And he goes through all the things that you might want to have if you or your family gets exposed to radiation. Because if you get exposed to radiation, there are things you can do to make it less painful, less uh, long-term damaging. There are things you can do to flush it out of your system faster than you could otherwise without those assets. Try to get those assets while you still can because, uh, you know, in a radiological emergency, you either won't be able to go out and get them, and if you could, there's going to be a lot of other people vying for them. So grab them now. That's what we did. We got a whole bin there. Check out Hoople uh, Cat's uh, video on that if you want to find out everything that is in here because I, I pretty much just use his playbook because he's a super smart guy and he made a really great video on it. 
Okay, down underneath here, we've got a bunch of juice boxes, and we've got some Gatorade, and we have some, uh, some soy milk and uh, almond milk. This is all shelf-stable stuff here. And this uh, sort of starts bringing up uh, kind of an aspect of what's going on in here in the fallout shelter, is that this stuff isn't, you know, if we're going to be stuck in here for two weeks, I don't think we're going to drink that many juice boxes. <laughs> but we're using this space as a way of storing things that, you know, we need to store anyway. So uh, it's nice to have those here. And we're trying to store things in here that uh, you, you might be able to use in a radiation emergency. But barring a, a situation where we need to use this as a fallout shelter, there's just a great place for storing all this stuff. We Pretty much the only time I use juice boxes is when we go camping. And that's what they're sitting here for. So when we, we go camping, I come in here and I stock up with what I need for the camping trip. And, and that's the end of that. And then they're already here if we ever need them in a radiation emergency. Uh, obviously, we're all set on potatoes for that department as well. Flipping over to the other side over here, we get another shelf. A lot of these boxes up here are just empty boxes. We're still kind of working on uh, getting all of our food squared away in here. Uh, at the moment, uh, almost the entire top shelf and the entire uh, second shelf from the top are all open, and even these boxes here are all empty. So we still got a lot of uh, shelf real estate that we're going to be filling up. Uh, you know, over the next couple of weeks, depending on, uh, you know, how fast things accelerate. We've got a, th a thermometer on here that just gives us a sense of the temperature, and it's a really comfortable 70 degrees in here. Now, that's not really super cool for a root cellar. It's not a great uh, temperature uh, for storing food, like these apples and onions and things that we have here. Uh, during the summer, uh, it, it does get warm in here, and th this root cellar is something that's more, it acts more like a root cellar during the winter months, so after the harvest, when things start getting cool, it'll hang out at about 40 degrees. It usually uh, hangs out about 40 degrees uh, during most of the uh, most of the winter time. So uh, that'd be about five degrees centigrade is what it is over the over the winter. But in the summertime, uh, when it's warm outside, even though we've got all that that mound up top and all the plants, you know, we're uh, we're a little a bit above. Uh, 20 degrees centigrade. I'm trying to learn Celsius because it's, uh, I don't know, a uh, way of measuring temperature that actually makes sense <laughs> instead of the, the uh, Fahrenheit scale that we learn here here in the States. So, uh, but it's a comfortable temperature for human beings here in, uh, right now. And it's great because there's no air conditioning. It's just, uh, that's the natural temperature under the ground, you know, getting that free cooling. All right, what do we got up here? We've got some ginger ale. Uh, why do I have ginger ale up here? Just to, like, you know, we're going to be doing mixed drinks, having a party. No, uh, ginger ale is a super effective uh, thing that you can take into your body if you're feeling nauseous. And if we're dealing with uh, radiation and people might have been somewhat exposed, ginger ale is, you know, it's one way that you can try to combat that. So I grabbed some of this and uh, brought it in here. I think I might actually stack a little bit more on here since we got the room. Right underneath there, uh, we've got some pasta. It says burritos. It's an old burrito box. But this is just a bunch of bags of penne pasta. And underneath, it's a whole box of marinara sauce. Are we going to be having like an Italian party in here every single night while we're in here? If we were stuck in here for, uh, you know, radiation emergency? No, we wouldn't. But again, I'm using the space as storage, and it was an extra place to put a whole case of pasta sauce. We have it here for an emergency, but it's just extra storage otherwise. Coming down below that, we have a kind of a mixed box here. We got a bunch of pinto beans in the back here, which we could soak and then cook. Uh, we've got some ramen noodles, a couple things of ramen noodles, and uh, these are some dried, dehydrated vegetables that we can use for uh, you know soups and things. We're going to be bringing more stuff in here. I want to bring more rice in here, more salts and seasonings in here. We're just starting to stock this place for you know food and and, and all that. But I want to kind of share this uh, this stage in the process for you because uh, it's an ongoing thing. Once we get this place finished, unquote, it's still not going to be finished. We're, we're always going to be making tweaks, adjustments, improvements because uh, that's just the way it is o over your life. Uh, Canadian Prepper has a great line. I love it. Uh, he he's always saying there is no finish line, and it's true. You know, you just you keep going and going and going and trying to make things better every day. But there is no finish line. Once you get to what you thought was the finish line, you realize it's the starting line for the next challenge. So we got a lot of uh, peaches here. Uh, you know, I think honestly, I just have peaches because I read the book *The Road*, uh, that Cormac McCarthy book a while ago, and they were so happy in that book to find canned peaches. Uh, they have a, a special place in my prepper heart to have canned peaches, even though I'm honestly not a not a huge fan of canned peaches. What I am a, a huge fan of is citrus fruits, and we've got a crap ton of citrus fruit all in cans down here. Now, if we were actually going to try to consume all this, I mean, this is this is citrus fruit <laughs> front to back. All the way. I don't even. You'd have to do multi, some multiplication to find out exactly how many cans are in there. It's 
probably hundreds of cans. I mean, if we were, um, we were using this for uh, actually eating, and we ate all that stuff over a two week period if we were stuck down here, um, I don't know what that toilet <laughs> situation would be looking like, but there, it, it, there, there wouldn't be a lot of solids in there. So, you know, we're not planning on necessarily going crazy, giving ourselves diarrhea by having this much uh, canned food. But again, it's a place to store it. And I think you definitely would want to have plenty of that if you were, you know, stuck in here. So this is where we store a lot of our, our canned fruit. And it continues all the way down here with pineapples and tropical fruit and citrus salad. Uh, pineapples coming, continuing all back through here. And in the back over here, we've got uh, canned corn, which, uh, you know, you can use for uh, soups uh, or just eating, eating canned corn. So that's the food that we have in here uh, at the moment. I'm definitely going to be adding more. Oh, I almost forgot. We've got one more thing. Got some baked beans in here as well, because uh, that's an easy thing to just kind of heat up and you don't need... Uh, uh, to do you know do much uh, with it beyond that. One thing that we are planning on getting in here, which I want to get in here, uh, you know, sooner than later, is how are you going to get in here? Can opener. <laughs> we need a can opener in here. We haven't put that into our utensils yet, but that is uh, going to be something we got to bring in here because you know, you can have all, all the cans in the world, but it's a huge pain in the butt to get into them without a can opener. And it might even be a good idea to have two in case the first can opener breaks. You don't want to, you know, my kingdom for a can opener. All right, so let's move into uh, you know the section of this place that is not kind of our pantry in here. What do we got in here? Looks like some shelves. They're also bunk beds. We got three bunk beds and I built them so that they could be shelves uh, because if there's not a fallout emergency and we want to use this place for uh, you know root cellar and storage, I, I, lo I love getting double use out of things. So I, I built these so that they are totally legit shelves for storage. Uh, you know, someday people learn how to resolve their dis di uh, differences without uh, blowing each other up. You know, I'm not holding my breath for that one, but if someday it happens and I didn't feel like I was ever going to need to sleep down here, it'd be nice to be able to just stack things on there and they're perfectly, perfectly good shelving units. Now, what's on them at the moment is a lot of water jugs. Now, why do we have water jugs on here? Well, uh, water is very important. Obviously, you need water for life. You need air, you need water, you need food, uh, and you need shelter. Uh, if we were going to be using this space, the first thing we would do is come in here and we would start filling these up with water. Now, how would we do that? We've got a hose here. It's just a loose hose with a, kind of an on-off switch here and a little screw-on section there. And this hose would get connected right up here to that. Now, this is where the uh, water comes in, or power comes in. Uh, that. FM and shortwave radio and the internet cable and everything come in here. We also have water come in. And this isn't just a regular garden hose. This is the kind of garden hose that you would use if you were uh, you know, RVing at a campground. And this is one that you can run water through and it's supposed to like not impart a bunch of you know, uh, rubber and plastic uh, tea kind of flavors into it. So it's a potable water hose. So we would hook on here and we would start filling up all of these things. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that we would want to have backup water. Now, at the moment, uh, we could get water. It's pressurized uh, coming in through this line here. We have 50 PSI water in the house. That's where the line comes from. By the time it gets out here, I've got a limiter on it, and the limiter uh, I've got tuned down to just 20 PSI. Reason for that? Uh, you don't need 50 PSI out here, and why, why mess with all that extra pressure that could, ca could cause leaks and things like that? 20 PSI was just fine. So what we would do is we would start filling up all of these uh, jugs. Now, uh, that's going to be useful so that we have access to water. Let's say the power goes out. Well, if the power in the house goes out, uh, we have backup power here. There is this unit over here, and this would provide us with uh, you know the backup power that we would need if the house system went down, as long as this system is still working. But let's say that this system stops working. You know, what do, we, what do we do in that case? Well, in that case, we're going to need water, and we would have already uh, pre-filled all the jugs, and uh, where would they be sticking? Obviously, we want to sleep on these. These are bunks, and we've even got the, uh, the camping bedroll all ready to roll out on there. Uh, we would stick these guys right over here, right in front of the door. We'll let the uh, camera kind of adjust. This door here does not offer any radiation shielding at all. It's a couple of layers of wood, and there's some foam in there, and that's it. So if I were standing where I'm standing right now, and there was a bunch of radiation outside, it would be just pounding through the, right through the door and pounding through my body. Uh, well, what do we do about that? Well, what you can do is add shielding, and all those jugs filled up with water, stacked 
on these steps, two layers thick with staggered joints, would offer quite a bit of shielding. Now we also have something here uh, that's called geometric shielding. You see that it's a 90 degree angle. As you come in, you have to make a 90 degree turn to come in here. Now a lot of the charged particles, you know, it, the water's not even going to stop all of them. They're going to just going to be flying past here and they're going to be hitting this back wall there. Energized particles, alpha, beta, uh, gamma particles, they're not going to be flying through the air and make a 90 degree turn and then just of their own discretion kind of come in here. So we've got that kind of geometric shielding. But to add to it, we're going to use the water as shielding and it's a great way to keep the water out of the way because we can store an awful lot of these stackable jugs up there. What else do we have on here? I mentioned we've got these bed rolls. They're ready to roll out. We also have these things in right here. Get a little switch. And oh, I gotta turn on another switch. We've got a power switch, uh, power strip right here. I'm gonna turn on our power strip that provides power to this, which provides power to all these. We got little reading lights, identical reading lights in every little cubby, so you can lay down, read a book, or do whatever you want to do. I think it's important, and we've got daylight uh, balance on that as well. Daylight or tungsten, you know, depending. Like uh, this might be good to do this color during the daytime in, you know, by your watch. And then you, when it's getting time for going to bed, switch to this color to kind of keep your circadian rhythm because uh, you're living underground. It help uh, stave off the insanity. Um, I think it's important to be able to kind of change your body position. So you can be in this space and there's plenty of room, uh, floor to ceiling. Uh, I think that's about, uh, I think these are seven foot walls in here. So you can stand in here and you have the ability to lie down in here, uh, you know, to, to rest. And also, what we've got over here, just back in here in these little blue bags, there's three uh, camping fold-out chairs. So we can sit, we can stand, we can lay down. I think it's important to be able to move through all, all your body's sort of natural positions so you don't get cramped and feel like you are, you know, just uh, going stir-crazy and, uh, you know, stuck in a box, which you kind of are. So we'll turn this bag off. We got a couple last things to talk about uh, in, in regards all of what's what's coming in over here. Now I mentioned uh, earlier in this video that you know, water is super important, but uh, water wasn't the first thing that I mentioned. I said uh, air, water, and food. Air is super important. You can live for a couple of days without water, but you can only live a couple of minutes without air. So it's, re it's a really important thing to uh, have air. And I'm throwing the camera back on that tripod I grabbed earlier. And what I want to talk about over here is uh, the system that we have for getting air in here. Now, this right here is a four inch vent. It goes out uh, outside uh, and it uses that geometric shielding. It goes out and then there's a 90 degree angle uh, that goes up. And then there's, I think, another 45 degree angle that goes straight up into the uh, um, the filter box that draws air up through uh, a couple of HEPA, HEPA filters and it brings it in through through this vent right here. I'll just plug it in so you can get a sense. This throws a lot of air. I mean, I, I can't visually, uh, I can't, well, here. You can see how much air is coming through there by how it's playing with this shirt. It's got an awful lot of air coming through there. And that's really important because if you have people in this space and you need to breathe, you really need to be replacing that air. And this does something else. It's bringing air that's filtered down in here and that air has to go somewhere. It, uh, you can't just, uh, you know, if you have a, a, a balloon and you try to blow, blow a balloon up inside of like a soda bottle, or you forget that, just take a soda bottle and try to blow into it. You can't blow into it if you've got your lips wrapped around you because there's no way, no place for the air to go. You need to have a place for that air to go. Well, there are cracks all around this place, I'm sure. I know that there's cracks around these little light tubes, the, around the door there's cracks. If you don't have positive pressure running into this space, you're gonna have little things coming in through those cracks. It's gonna be bringing in radioactive dust from outside. So it's important to have a little bit of positive pressure, making it so that air pushes out from the inside instead of air coming in from the outside, because air coming in from the outside could be bringing fa radioactive fallout into your space, and then that would defeat the whole purpose of being in here. Well, not the entire purpose. I'm sure what comes in would be much less than 
being up on the surface. But you go through all this trouble to create a space like this. You want to make it as clean and pristine as you can. So this uh, fan unit uh, can run on various settings. It's got like a little uh, dial, so you can uh, turn it up higher or lower. And that is going to bring fresh air in here so that we're not asphyxiating to death and dying in a, in a coffin, and also making it so that we have positive pressure pushing out through all the holes to make sure that you know we're not bringing uh, fallout ash in here. Now what happens if this goes down? Uh, you know we've got the the, the solar uh, off-grid system on the house which sends power in here. That could go down. We've got the backup solar system which is over here which uses uh, 10 deep cycle lead acid batteries. Uh, I did not buy those specifically for this application. It's an old solar system that I'd had from another house. I brought it here and I figured I might, might as well set it up here. Um, so, you know, that wasn't something that I bought specifically for this, but it's a great use for it because uh, I've, I've got it set up. The batteries are continually being topped off so that they, you know, stay in good condition. And if we ever need them, we've got that backup system. But let's say both systems go down. Let's say there's an electromagnetic pulse and it takes down both systems. Uh, EMP pulses are very unpredictable. The science on them is it's kind of fuzzy in terms of like what it would impact, what it wouldn't impact, depends on where it goes off, and you know so many different little uh, you know details that you know, we haven't we, we fortunately haven't been through, uh, so we don't have a lot of experience with it. Let's say all the electrical systems go down though. What are we going to do? It'll be dark in here, like when we came in, but. We, also, we have to breathe. Even if we're uncomfortable because it's dark, we got to breathe. How do we do that? Well, I've got this mounting bracket on the wall here with these little pins, and that is what this here is for. This is a bellows. And I made it out of uh, some wood. I created a box. This is one of those collapsible uh, yard waste bags, like a leaf bag, and it makes nice big bellows. There are two check valves, uh, just little four inch um, blower vent check valves. One on this side designed to blow that way, one on this side uh, designed to allow air to go in that on that side, and it snaps right into this this thing on the wall. Got these little pins that slide into place. I'm not going to put them into place because they're, they're a little sticky and it's hard to get them back out later. Um, and then this little bent piece of pipe just goes in here and it connects it to, and we use duct tape that's in one of the little toolbox bins over there. And then we're able to run this. And this is pretty low uh, energy. You can just kind of push and gravity will, will refill the thing. And you can, you can uh, you know, sit in different positions. I think you, know, you could probably kind of use your legs if you wanted, or one, you know, one leg will do it. I wanted to make this thing to make it as easy as it possibly could be to operate because, you know, if you needed to use this to breathe, you'd have to use it for a while. So I tried to make it so that uh, it, it wouldn't kill you uh, to, be, uh, to, to be running this thing. People would probably, hopefully, take turns with this. But the amount of air that this thing blows out is pretty substantial. It's uh, at least as forceful as that is. I, I take the shirt off, but you only pay, uh, you only get one of those with the price of it. <laughs> um, so you know, I'll just I'll take my word for it. It is a, it's about as strong as uh, as that guy uh, blowing. And if you think about it, this entire volume of air, what is that? Like uh, three three cubic feet, perhaps, gets shot into the room in one motion. So we're three cubic feet, six cubic feet. 9 cubic feet, it adds up really quickly, so it doesn't take a lot of this. I don't think you'd even have to do this non-stop in order to keep the air, air fresh in this space. So there's one other thing that I wanted to show you guys, and again, it, it pertains to you know the benefits of having a space like this outside of whether or not there's a, a radiation emergency, and that is these boxes right here. These are boxes of clothes. If we were stuck in here for a couple of weeks, you're not going to wear one outfit, you're going to want to kind of change your outfits out. And uh, one of the great things about uh, having these boxes of clothes here is, I don't know, you know, if you're like me, you know, you, you get a lot of clothes and some of them are your favorite ones you tend to wear because they're more comfortable. And then there's other clothes, it's like, they're perfectly good clothes, but, you know, they're not your favorites, they don't get a lot of use. That's what we put in all of these boxes for everybody. Uh, everybody has their own individual box of clothing and we filled it with the kind of things that people have and it's totally fine clothing but you know we just don't like wearing it so not only did we get clothing in here but we were also able to clean out bureaus and closets in the house uh, with stuff that you know we didn't want to throw away because it's perfectly good but you know it wasn't getting any use in there so having them out here it's just another way of kind of uh, cleaning up the house um, you know 
So we're getting that kind of multiple benefit, even if there, and hopefully there never is, a radiological emergency where we have to use the space. Instantly, it's being used as a way of helping us to clean up the house. One last thing you might notice here is, uh, is this. This is just a dehumidifier. We do need to run the mechanical dehumidifier in order to keep this place from getting overly humid. Uh, in fact, it's probably full of water. I should probably empty that out. If we were stuck in here and we lost power at the same time, uh, it would start getting pretty darn humid in here. We'd be bringing in fresh air from, from here. Uh, and, you know, I think we'd be okay for a couple of weeks, but, uh, you know, well, <laughs> Well, so we'd find out as we, as we went. It, if you're in an environment and there's a lot of like mold spores and things like that, it can be very unhealthy. So we're trying to keep this area nice and clean and dry, and uh, that thing just runs nonstop. Uh, well, not nonstop, but it's on a timer. Um, you know, every day it goes on for a couple of hours and, and pulls the moisture out of the air to just make it so that this area doesn't turn into a mold factory because I guarantee those potatoes and onions and things behind you on the shelf would just be piles of mold if this thing wasn't running. So I hope you found this tour helpful. Uh, this is something that I take awfully seriously. I don't talk about it on my channel much because, um, you know, I, I, I don't live in the, the mindset of being constantly worried about things. There are things on the horizon that I'm aware of, and I, I fold into my plans uh, countermeasures to try to address those things, but it doesn't occupy my entire life uh, where I'm just like constantly, uh, you know, listening to the radio, waiting for, you know, the bomb to drop, or, uh, you know, constantly, uh, you know, staring at my bug out bag, you know, wondering, you know, when's the time, you know, is it zero hour yet? You know, I don't live in that kind of mindset. I live in, you know, the wonderful world that we live in, you know, is, 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 I don't want to use the word bad, but the world is not as wonderful as it could be. That fair enough? People have a lot more potential than uh, they live up to much of the time, and because the world we live in is a world created by people, our world has a lot more potential to be good than it really lives up to. Uh, and that's unfortunate, but that's reality, and you have to live within that. And you know, just because things aren't wonderful, you know, you still have a right to enjoy your life. And that's what I do. That's what we here at our homestead do. Every day we're enjoying our lives. I enjoy doing the projects. I enjoy the building. To be honest, putting this place together was a lot of fun because it was like putting together kind of like a, sort of like a, like, like a Mars base. You know, you're going to bring everything in that you need to, you know, live off of. And we are planning on doing kind of a dry run where we're going to be in here and We'll stay in here for at least 24 hours where we just try everything out and make sure that everything works. We're going to bring a CO2 meter in here and make sure that we're getting enough air uh, in here and, uh, and just try the whole thing out. I get a lot of enjoyment out of this. I do it because I think it's really important to protect yourself and protect your family. Uh, I enjoy it because I think it's fun and I think it's interesting. So I hope that you find the enjoyment side, side of this. You know, none of us can choose the world that we live in. I, we can try. We can choose what kind of future we make for ourselves and our children. But in terms of the way things are right now, none of us have a choice in that at the moment. So the best you can, uh, the best you can do is to figure out what's the best thing you can do with the time that's given to you here on this earth. And uh, I choose to create things, plan, think about things, try to make my tomorrow better than it would be if I didn't plan. And that's why I like sharing these things with you guys. So if you haven't made any plans in terms of whether there might be a need for something like a fallout shelter or something to protect yourself and your family, think about it. It can be an enjoyable project and uh, you know, it doesn't have to be to this scale. Uh, even if you just have a, a basement, there are ways of turning a basement into a fallout shelter. In fact, I made a video. Uh, it uses Lego minifigures and things. Here's a link to it right now if you want to check that out. Um, uh, you can turn a basement into a pretty functional fallout shelter. Uh, you know, so if you don't have this, you could at least have that. You know, if I had more resources myself, if I had more money, if I had more time, um, if uh, the, the the landscape of this place where we were building was more uh, accommodating, I probably would have built something bigger and better than this. Also, you know, so whatever whatever limitations you have in your life, you just do the best you can with them. You know, this was what we were able to achieve. If you're in a situation where it's just you can retrofit a basement, go for it. You can at least make your life better if you have that. And if you have the ability to do something like 10 times better than this, go for it. It's very interesting. I find it's rewarding. And in an emergency situation, it could be very, very rewarding. That's it. Good luck. And thanks for watching. 
This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.